Welcome, welcome back, welcome home to Second Church. Thank you for joining us this morning on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Here we are, we are officially in summer, if you haven't figured it out yet. And thank you for uh, braving the heat and joining us here. And whether you're in person or joining us on Zoom, you are welcome, you are part of our community. Um, I have just one announcement before, well, two announcements actually, before we get started with worship. First, um, I am happy on behalf of the church to welcome back Mark Vitalik, uh, joining us here this morning on Oregon and Piano. Always good to have you with us, Mark. And second, something a little bit more serious. So, last week during worship, someone brought up some prayers for Wendy Lanier's. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this. So the prayer was that uh, we, uh, someone said, you know, Wendy is um, suffering from cancer. And I said, I had just talked to Wendy and I don't, I don't think that makes any sense to me because we hadn't talked about this. And let me tell you what this was. This was an internet scam. And so I want to tell you to be aware of internet scams through Facebook. And this is often how it works, and this is how it works. Someone created a, a second profile under Wendy's name, using Wendy's photo, and pretended to be her, and then took advantage of the generous hearts of church people by saying, I'm suffering, and can you help me with some money to help pay for treatments? Now, I haven't heard of anybody who actually got scammed for money, but I've heard of several people in the church who have been approached by this person. So here's what you've got to do. First of all, as someone who's been using Facebook, personally me, for 20 years, this happened. And you've got to watch out for this stuff. So if you get a friend request from somebody that you're already friends with on Facebook, chances are it could be somebody that's pretending to be that person that's setting up a second account. You've got to be vigilant for these kinds of things because bad actors are out there and they take advantage, especially of people who maybe aren't as um, uh, hip with technology or I just have generous hearts like church people do and so I hear this from my colleagues all the time that these things are out there. Another common scam is people will send an email that's very similar to the pastor's email address but not quite the same and say oh do you think you can um, maybe oh I can't talk right now but you know, there's somebody in need, and can you send uh, maybe some uh, Amazon gift cards and scratch them off and send me the code, and that way I can help people. These are scams. And so please be careful. And if somebody, you know, like pretending to be me or pretending to be somebody from the church reaches out and is asking you for money over the internet, don't do that. <laughs> Maybe if you have their phone number and you call them and you say, hey, Adam, is this you? Um, this doesn't sound like you. Or I just want to make sure this is a real thing. And if any of this is happening, um, don't be afraid to say, somebody reached out to me and I almost got duped. Please let us know in the church office so that we can alert the congregation that this is happening, all right? So I did want to say that as an announcement, we also put something on our Facebook page saying the same thing. Um, usually these things blow over, but sometimes they come back in a cycle. So I just wanted to say that as an announcement this morning. Are there any other announcements before we start with worship today? We'll have time for prayers later, but just announcements. Well, then let us join our hearts, minds, and voices in worshiping God. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, let us gather at this 
sacred time and place. Open minds and open hearts. We are bound by love and faith into unity in Christ. Forgiveness flowing freely, renewing our spirits. In Christ we are made whole, connected in grace. Our hearts transformed, our lives intertwined. Let us worship with gratitude and humility. Honoring our God, our source of eternal hope. I invite you to rise and body our spirit for the singing of our opening hymn, number 465, Lord Be Glorified. As we come before God in joy and praise, so we also come before God in honesty about our shortcomings and failings. Please join me in our prayer of grounding in God's grace. Loving God, too often we forget your promise. We live in ways that bring glory only to ourselves. We bask in the false assumption that we are in full control of our lives. Sometimes we want to tamper with the lives of those around us for our own ends. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to serve you more faithfully each day. Amen. Friends, God hears the honesty of our lips and of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven, and by the Holy Spirit, we are empowered for new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as a forgiven and forgiving people, let us share the peace of Christ with those around us. May the peace of Christ be with you. He's also with you. I invite you to either share a hug or a handshake or a fist bump or a peace sign. As we are comfortable, let us share peace with each other. Peace to those who are joining us on Zoom this morning. Always good to see you, Robert and Lauren, and
Our scripture reading today is in the entirety of the letter of Paul and Timothy to Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus. This letter is one of the shortest complete books in the Bible. In this letter, Paul is writing to Philemon and the church that meets in his house about Onesimus, someone who has been enslaved by Philemon but escaped or was sent to Paul. Paul asked Philemon and the church to receive Onesimus back and not to have a slave, but as a brother, using his power of persuasion and influential writing style. Paul appeals to Philemon's morals rather than to Paul's own authority in asking him to do the right thing. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church in a reading of the letter to Philemon. From Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our companion in the struggle, and to the church that meets in your house. Grace and peace from our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I always mention you in my prayers and thank God for you because I hear of the love and faith you have for our Savior, Jesus, and for all the saints. I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you'll fully understand all the good things we're able to do for the sake of Christ. I find great joy and comfort in your love because through you the hearts of the holy ones have been refreshed. Therefore, though I feel I have every right in Christ to command you to do what you ought to do to be done, I prefer to appeal in the name of love. Yes, I, Paul, an ambassador and now a prisoner for Christ, appeal to you for my child, of whom I have become the parent during my imprisonment. He has truly become Onesimus, useful, for he who was formerly useless to you in now useful indeed, both to you and to me. It is he that I am sending to you, and that means I am sending I had wanted to keep him with me, that he might help me in your place while I'm in prison for the good news, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent. So that kindness might not be forced on you, but be freely bestowed. Perhaps he was separated from you for a while for this reason, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a subordinate, but as more especially dear to me, and how much dearer he'll be to you, since now you know him both in the flesh and in Christ. If you regard me as a partner, then welcome Onesimus as you would me. If he has done you any injury or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this in my own hand. I agree to pay and I won't even mention that you owe me your very self. You see, my friend, I want to make you useful to me in Christ. Refresh this heart of mine in Christ. I write with complete confidence in your obedience, since I am sure you will do even more than I ask. There is one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me. I hope to re be restored through your prayers. Ephorus, a prisoner with me in Christ Jesus, sends greetings, and so my colleagues, Mark, Archisus, Themis, and Luke, may the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This ends the reading, so read it. So this morning we return to 
another complete book of the Bible. We've been doing this uh, a little bit every now and then. And this is one of the shortest ones. You're welcome, Donna. And so uh, one thing I was reflecting on, I think, I think it was with Don a few weeks ago, is uh, that a lot of the New Testament is just other people's mail that we've sort of intercepted over the years and has become part of our scriptural canon. And so here we have a, just a pretty normal letter, not too long. You can really follow it pretty closely. But what does it have to say to us and why is it part of the Bible? What does it have to teach to us today? And I, I love this letter because it's so short, and I think I, think I get it. Um, but this time when I was reading it through, it made me think a little bit about the Godfather. It did. Now, uh, one thing that uh, David and I have been doing uh, this year was, you know, we have the library pretty close to us, and we're not very good about checking books out of there, but we've been doing that and remembering, oh yeah, there's DVDs there too. So I said, let's watch some classic films. And I'm sorry to say, but we had never seen The Godfather. So we said, okay, that's one of those big ones. We better check it out and, and at least see what it's about. And when I was reading this letter to, to Philemon, I was like, Paul's got a little bit of persuasion in him. <laughs> you know, Paul's got some lines in there, and uh, what's, what's, what's going on, and maybe you caught this when, when Donna was reading, so there's this man whose name is Onesimus, and Onesipus, Onesimus is, um, it's hard to tell exactly, but it seems like um, he is some sort of servant or slave to this man Philemon. But somehow he has escaped or uh, went on some unauthorized vacation and ends up with Paul. And Paul's in prison and Onesimus uh, is visiting him and they're together for some bit of time and they've grown close. In this time. Paul sort of says he's like my child in Christ and he's been learning about um, the faith and taking care of Paul somehow and so Paul writes this letter and he says Philemon you know I've really gotten to know this Onesimus and I'm sending him back to you but not as a slave as a brother in Christ. And Paul says he truly has become Onesimus. And that name means useful. He truly has become Onesimus because he was formerly useless to you, but now he is useful. Now he is Onesimus, indeed, to both you and me. And so I'm sending him to you. I'm sending my own heart. And a little bit later on, he says, if you regard me as a partner, then welcome Onesimus as you would me. If he's done you any injury, owes you anything, charge it to me. It's very similar to how the good Samaritan uh, spoke in, in that parable. Anything that's owed, I'll pay it. I agree to pay. And then Paul says, and this is where I'm thinking Godfather-esque, I won't even mention that you owe me your very self. <laughs> well, clearly he did mention it because we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. <laughs> you see, my friend, I want to make you useful to me in Christ. Refresh this heart of mine in Christ. I write with complete confidence in your obedience, since I'm sure you'll do even more than I ask. Paul has this power of persuasion that, I don't know, I have this love-hate thing with Paul, I don't know how you feel about Paul, 
but he does know how to write a persuasive essay. And I think, you know, this is one of them. Paul is saying, you know, uh, you don't really owe me anything. I didn't do nothing for you. You know, I maybe taught you about Jesus, saved your life, turned you all around, helped you build this church, and, you know, really, you know, saved you from all of these things. But it's, it's not about me. It's about, it's about Jesus. It's about that. It's not about me. But if you were to remember any of that, here's Onesimus. I think what Paul is trying to do here is to teach Philemon how to live out faith in Christ. Not just to say things, not just to, you know, host gatherings, because there's a church that meets in their house, uh, Philemon, and I do want to say the letter as it is in our Bible is called the letter to Philemon, but it's written to Philemon and Aphia and Archippus. And so all of them, maybe it's not clear exactly how they're related, but all of them together are leaders in this church. And so Paul is saying, listen, I know that you're trying to do this Jesus thing. I know you're trying to gather for worship. You're trying to learn the scriptures, and follow Christ. But here's one way that you can show me that you really know what this Jesus thing is all about. Do you remember this slave, Onesimus? You can welcome him back, but not as a slave anymore, but as a brother. And then if I see that, I know that this Jesus thing is real for you. You see, when we are trying to follow Jesus, we're doing those things that Jesus preached about, about healing the sick, about letting people who are bound go free, about releasing the captives and restoring sight to people who are living in blindness. This, these are the kinds of things we can do. You know, I'd like to think that one day maybe I can do one of those things like Jesus, like spit in mud and then sort of rub it on people's eyes and then all of a sudden they can see. I don't know if that's really ever going to be in the cards for me. Maybe it is for you, but I can only hope. One thing I know that I can do, though, is welcome people as equals, no matter what their status was before. And I can fight for them to become free, because that's something all of us can do. You see, we have uh, this Savior that has, I, I don't know, there's, there's kind of like two ways to think about following Jesus. You think about following the way of the cross, you know, li uh, you know, facing all of your burdens and, and really just knowing that it's going to be hard and we're going to suffer. That's one, one way of it. But then Jesus also says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all who are weary. And I think both of those ways are ways that we can think about following Christ because there are ways that are personally going to be difficult for each one of us facing those things that are inside of ourselves, those places, those dark corners that we don't like to visit, shedding light and growing as individuals. But there's also those things that help really lift the yoke off of others and help us all grow together as a society. And so those are the kinds of things that we can just do on our own and help to really make true those other uh, phrases, you know, things we'll read like in Galatians, 
where in Christ Jesus there, there is no male or female, there is no slave or free, there is no Jew or Greek, there's no like hierarchies. That's not saying that there aren't those things, but they're saying all of us are one in Christ Jesus. No one's better, no one's worse. We all gotta work to just uplift everybody in society, especially those who are the most looked down upon or the most oppressed. Just look in the news to see, you know, who is the scapegoat this week? What can we do to help them out? This is the work of the church in our day. One challenge I'm going to put out for us as a congregation this week is to write a note. Maybe it's to somebody else in the church. Maybe it's to a relative. Could be just the size of a postcard. Who knows? Maybe it'll get intercepted and read for hundreds of years. But just, I'd like you to find somebody that you think is modeling one of Jesus' teachings. And write them with your own hand a note that says what you've seen. Because we need these notes to help remind us, to help restore us in faith. Because we do this not as an individual, but Christianity as a team sport. Now, I'm going to end here, but I want to give a little bit of a teaser for this next hymn because I've chosen trust and obey now <laughs> this is one of those old-timey hymns and, and Mark and I were talking about this a little bit um, before worship because this is not the exact kind of theology that I usually would like to uh, ascribe to like the only way to, to go is to trust and obey but I wanted to just respond to kind of the persuasive nature of Paul's letters and to think maybe there is something in that that, that we can get because we're, we're congregationalists. We're the kind of people that say, you can't tell me what to do. But maybe Jesus can tell us what to do. Do you think you can buy that with me? So think about that when we sing this next hymn. And so I'm going to, I know there's an asterisk in the bulletin, but I'm going to invite us to remain seated as we sing together our next hymn, number 443, Trust and Obey.
prayers for our church, prayers for the world. And so if you have a prayer to share, just raise your hand, start by saying your name so we all get to know each other better. And if you're joining us on Zoom, um, also feel free to join in. And Donna, can you go around with the mic? Can you go around with the microphone? Continued prayers for Laura <coughs> and I'm glad to report that Eileen is feeling much better. In fact, the whole family rode in the 4th of July parade and tossed candy to the kids. Right, so Gail, continued prayers for Laura and also um, prayers of joy that Eileen's feeling better. So I say prayers for everybody in this church. Everybody, I love. Thanks, Amy. Prayers for everybody. Thank you. Good morning, Tracy Dixon. I uh, wanted to extend prayers for my good friend Sharon, who had to say goodbye to her mother this week. Um, it's been a long road, um, but she's at peace, and um, we'll be celebrating her life tomorrow. Thanks, Teresa. So our prayers go out to Sharon's whole family um, as they're mourning their mom. Ruth, I would like prayers for the DiVigilio family and the loss of uh, Elaine's husband and the children's father. Thanks, Ruth, for that prayer. Do you know his name, or? We'll pray for the Diva Julia family. Mary Beth? My niece is... Hold the mic right up close so we can hear you better. My niece... So praying for your niece. Okay, praying for your niece Brittany as she had to move out of the house. And let's talk about that too after church, okay? Prayers for Brittany. Prayers for the people in the world who are hungry for whatever reason. Um, it, it, it seems to be a wide Prayers for our country, for the world, for leaders to be wise, courageous, and Patty Boynton. Thanks, Patty. Prayer for our leaders. My brother-in-law, James, was undergoing a variety of uh, health issues just recently. Prayers for James for all of his medical issues. Any prayers from Zoom this morning? Okay. Well, for all those prayers lifted up in voice and for all those that remain in our hearts, let us now turn to God in silent prayer. Let us pray.
Our pastoral prayer today comes from Richard Hayes, and it's called A Psalm of Summer's Siren. I salute you, God of rest and vacations, who laid down the law that every seventh day must be free. No work for beast, man, or woman was more than the word. On this summer day, when my heart longs for leisure, my head tells me it's time to go to work. I wish I had an extra Sabbath to enjoy your gift of liberty and peace. Part of me is so grown up and knows how to be productive, to be responsible, and to achieve. I've learned to listen to that inner adult and how to successfully silence the echoes of childhood's play. I may know and possess more, but I've lost something in being a repeat offender of God and breaking your law of seventh-day vacations. I have forgotten how to vacate my work, to come out of my head and go out of doors to play with you in the summer sun. We pray this and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, Mother, Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power. now to our time of communion, where this small table becomes transformed into the largest table in the world, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, there is a seat prepared just for you. In our church, we celebrate an open table. You don't have to be a member, you don't have to believe anything specific to be able to partake from this table. Because I'm not the host. Jesus is the host. All of us are guests. Jesus would, on that night, serve someone who would betray him, who would deny him, and all would desert him. And we remember that on that night, Jesus took bread and he broke it, and he gave it to each one of them, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took that cup and he blessed it, and he gave it to each one of them, and he said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, remember let us pray. Holy Spirit, be in this simple meal, be in this bread, be in this cup, so that as we partake, we may be transformed evermore into the body and the blood of Jesus, so that those who we encounter will know that they have met the living God. Help animate us, help feed that hungry piece of us that we didn't even know was there. Help make yourself real in ways that words and songs cannot. Amen. I invite our communion servers forward. We will partake this morning by uh, the servers coming to you in your pew, and you're invited to uh, eat the bread as you receive it. And then as we get the cups of juice, Hold on to those, and we will partake together. And eating the bread alone just is one way to symbolize our individual relationship with God, and drinking the cup together symbolizes our communal faith. Come now, all things are ready, the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us taste and see that God is me in our prayer of thanksgiving as printed. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received Christ's peace. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth the praise in our lives. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. And I invite you to rise for one final time to sing our closing hymn, number 359, Give Thanks. Christ and the care of the Holy Spirit 